Hello guys, I thought I'd give you a little bit of context for what's going on in this video before I drop you in the deep end. This was a presentation I delivered at one of my clients, Bastion Slots Mastermind, in January in Portugal this year. In attendance were 30, 40, 50 entrepreneurs doing anywhere from 50K a month, all up to individuals doing a million dollars per month in their education and coaching businesses. Um, Bass is a long-term client of mine. I've worked with him since 2019 when he was the first appointment setter. And now he runs two education coaching businesses doing a million dollars per month collectively, which is very cool. It's been an awesome to be part of that process and journey with him. And he's a good friend of mine also. So he uh, very nicely flies me out to Portugal every year to speak his events. And this was a presentation I delivered at the January event this year. The individuals that attended paid 50,000 to join his mastermind USD. And therefore this was the event they host every year for the individuals that enroll in his mastermind. Hope you guys enjoy. Any questions you have, drop them in the comment section down below or join my free school and converse with me there directly. Enjoy the video. Indian. Our quality of health determines whether we thrive or survive as of course entrepreneurs and human beings ultimately. And that's the motivation for starting the service in the first place. Fundamentally, my objective is to help as many people as possible as I possibly can become healthier. That's our objective as a company. And uh, we've got a few ways in which we tend to approach that this year. So in terms of clients I've worked with thus far, obviously Bass, that's the last of the mastermind last year. Uh, obviously Iman Gadzi, how many of you guys are aware of Iman? I'm sure pretty much everyone in the room. Worked with him three years in person whilst he was based in London as well. So worked with him from the outset when he was generating 50K per month in revenue, all the way up to about 500K per month prior to his move to Dubai. So seeing that evolution was also very interesting as well firsthand. Uh, Cole Gordon and also his president, Mitchell Miles, who recently quit, but I worked with Mitchell Miles for two years as well and Cole for about six months, which is a very cool experience. Other individuals in the space I refer to as being private geniuses. You guys can see the revenue on screen here. This is one of my clients, uh, Ismail's launch month for his software business, which is pretty outstanding to be fair. Um, it was really cool seeing him do that at that time period and how much work he put into the business to facilitate that growth as well. For context, that's a software business and it uh, attracts donations for charities, which is very, very cool. So it's, it's benefited both him and his family and of course charities also, which is very cool to see. Other individuals in the Latin American space, like Marco Rossetti, how many of you guys are familiar with him? Perhaps a few of you guys. He's doing about 250K per month right now as well, which is very cool. Other individuals from the outset, like the Mickelson twins, I worked with them back in 2019. They're doing very well right now as well. Other individuals, Timothy, Timothy Sanders, Billy Wilson, perhaps a few familiar faces as well. Firstly, what we're gonna do is we're gonna evaluate your health scores prior to moving forward. Okay, so as you guys can see on screen, I want you to quantify your quality of sleep based on the following categories. I won't read them out, but if you guys take 20 seconds or so to categorize your sleep quality, that would be great. I'll then ask around the room to determine what quality, how your quality of sleep is looking right now. Let me know when you guys are there. Pretty much done? Okay, who's in category A? Okay, B, awesome, C, D, E, anyone in F? Okay, awesome, we'll move forward. Training, let's quantify this. <laughs> okay, category A, B, C, D, E, and on F, one person. Nice man. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Nutrition. Also, if you guys have any questions about the terminology used throughout this, let me know with regards to the utility, like gut health tests, anything like that. So let me know if you've got any questions about that. I'll expand upon it at the end, but again, if you guys don't have context written out, it won't make sense. If it fits your macros. Okay, A, B, C, D, E, F, anyone G? No, okay, interesting. Okay, medical testing. How many of you guys have actually done any blood work before, or any gut health testing? A couple of you? Okay, cool. Who's category B? Category C? Okay. And supplementation. Okay, A, B, C, and D. Okay. 
body composition, this to an extent is subjective. Okay, A, B, C, D, E. No? Okay, cool. Okay, behavioral change. Effectively, what I'm referring to here is adherence to a process which conduces to a quality of health. You're either aware of it and adhere to it, or you're aware of it and, and of course, do not adhere to it. Who's an A? Yeah, B? Okay, most of you guys, and C? Okay, so fundamentally, we need to address, first and foremost, why you should prioritize your quality of health. Now, we have our own reasonings. For me personally, there's two primary reasons. First and foremost, of course, as I addressed earlier in the, uh, the week as well, I lost my dad to cancer four years ago. Of course, witnessing that experience and that process was excruciatingly painful as chemotherapy over a period of about two years was ghastly. But for me personally, it actually started off and stemmed from my childhood, really. My dad was a very well-renowned designer. He did design work for companies like the Champions League, Jammy Dodgers, Andrex Jaffa Cakes. Worked his ass off. Didn't make a huge amount of money for it. He worked for a company called Design Bridge, but of course was very well regarded in that company and sacrificed his health to build his career, so to speak. As a byproduct of that, of course, he got diagnosed with terminal cancer. Wanted to add a little bit of humor in here as well. When he got diagnosed, he thought this was really funny. He went on holiday, got a photo underneath the terminal sign as well. At least he kept a sense of humor, which I, I liked a lot, of course. But of course, that was a very traumatic experience and that motivated me to improve quality of health for individuals that I worked with as well. And of course, that's one fundamental why. A second reason, of course, is because personally, I want to do whatever it takes to win in terms of fulfilling my, my potential of my career and of course my life as a whole. And I'm sure many of you guys resonate with that also. Have you, how many of you guys watched the Last Dance documentary of Michael Jordan? If you haven't, you've got to watch it. It's such a motivating documentary and series and expands upon how he approached his career to, of course, become the best and world renowned. How many of you guys, of course, can actually resonate with the idea and, and the identity of doing whatever it truly takes to win and leveraging every single tiny advantage in your business? How many of you guys adhere to that process, that, that ideology? Yeah, I'm, I'm sure most of you guys in this room right now, right? Of course, as we facilitate further growth in business, and most of you guys are hovering between, what, 30K all the way up to, one, to 1 1.5 million per month in terms of revenue generated, you're now competing in an arena in which everyone wants to be the dominant player. Everyone is already smart, talented, and hardworking, and of course, has attained a, a huge and fundamental level of success at a very early age in their business. However, of course, what's going to facilitate growth and the next step for most individuals is actually addressing these variables on the screen. How many of you guys can resonate with constantly sacrificing your sleep, being plagued by brain fog daily, being victim of midday crash in terms of your energy and feeling like you're lagging throughout the day, being constantly fatigued, having to deal with tablet emotions on a daily basis, procrastination, being unable to think of crystal clear clarity, being stressed about your body composition and weight gain as a byproduct of working huge and strenuous hours, can't summon the necessary energy to work efficiently, perform inconsistently day in and day out, irritable, can't recall information with ease, are on the brink of burnout. How many of you guys can resonate with that in the room right now? A few of you. How many of you guys have experienced that throughout your careers when you're perhaps starting and really pushing hard? Right, okay, cool. Obviously at that point, your biology and your body is working against you. And you could regard yourself as being a smart person operating at only 60% of your capacity. My objective is to rectify that and assure the individuals we work with, of course, operate at 100% of their capacity. In order to do this, we must address the curse of early success. Now, most of you in this room are in your mid-20s, 30s, obviously mid-30s also. And of course, I refer to this as being the curse of early success. You were the best early, and you developed a massive blindness as a byproduct of being the smartest person in the room, perhaps being more naturally gifted than others, and therefore, of course, accruing huge financial wealth at an early age. You never learn to work efficiently at a high level. You have very poor life habits, not necessarily extremely poor, but some individuals have very poor life habits, levels of focus, productivity, and output, and very little understanding of self or how to maximize self ROI. You overcame all previous difficulties with raw talent, not possible at this level of the game in terms of competing with the best of the best in this space. In terms of clients I work with, I've seen how they meticulously approach all variables of their quality of health. And if you guys fail to do so, you'll be the individual on the left here, as opposed to the individual on the right that's dominating the space. I've worked with such a handful of individuals now that absolutely dominate the space, Eman, Cole, etc., and seen how they approach every variable of their life, particularly their health, in order to ensure they actually perform day in and day out at a very, very high level. Okay? Ultimately, the objective is to ensure the clients I work with, their inputs support their outputs they want to facilitate, and of course, leverage and benefit from on a daily basis. Very straightforward. These inputs, of course, 
uh, primarily make up what we do in terms of pillars we approach the clients we work with to, of course, obtain all variables of health and performance and ensure they're optimized. Okay. In terms of the process we personally take our clients through, it's quite straightforward and we approach it in this framework. So of course, we onboard the customer, we complete the testing and SwiftWin's work, personalization, and optimization, and then of course, arrive at the desired outcome of being peak performance is the term we refer to. In terms of how we approach that, I'm gonna take you guys through this step by step so you can actually leverage this process yourself. And of course, fundamentally start working all variables of your quality of health. So on screen, firstly, I have all the products we leverage with our customers. Are you guys familiar with this list of products or do you want me to run you through them step by step? Because I've got visuals as well, which I can dive into. How many of you guys have got an Aura Ring, got a health testing kit? How many of you guys are familiar with these products? Okay, I'll dive into them step by step. If you want to take a photo, do so now, because a couple of you are doing so. But we'll dive into each individual product. So how many of you test your sleep metrics right now, actually quantify your sleep currently? Only a handful, like 10 people thus far. Why do you guys not track your quality of sleep if you're not already? Is there any reason for doing so? Say again, mate, sorry. Did you not order the sizing kit? That's, yeah, that's genuinely the okay, okay, fair, mate. Anyone else? Anyone else got another reason for it? Go for it, man. Because sometimes I'd wake up, I mean, my sleep wasn't the best. Yeah. And then that would cost, like, a placebo. Not for sure. Not a placebo, but yeah, yeah, that's understandable. Maybe, maybe it's a cop out because I could just look at the, the metric at the end of the day. Yeah. I think that's what you do. Yeah, with all our clients. Um, yeah. But yeah, it, sometimes it gave me more anxiety for sure. to track the sleep rather than just like intuitively try to get, you know, my, my good sleep. For sure. <laughs> Any other reasons for not tracking quality of sleep? Go for it, man. I don't really feel like I would do something with the data. In terms of knowing how to leverage it or just not being bothered by it? First two weeks and then I don't do it anymore. Okay, cool. Any other reasons? Okay, interesting. Go for it, man. I mean, I've, I've used it in the beginning is that essentially um, there was days where it said I did sleep and maybe I was tracking it wrong. And then I would see, okay, I woke up in the morning, it said I had good sleep, but I felt like shit. Mm -hmm. I was like, this is bullshit. And I stopped. <laughs> okay, cool. I'll, I'll expand upon that, explain that. So on screen with one of my clients, Ryan, he's actually 55 and he has two kids as well. He's just recently exited from his recruitment business. You can see all of his metrics from the 24th. So I'll dive into these step by step and of course run you through which metrics I pay attention to first and foremost. So. Initially, our main priority with clients we work with is to establish their bedtime and their wake-up time and ensure this is consistent. This is really important for two reasons, to ensure their duration of sleep is adequate. Okay, so most clients we work with spend nine hours in bed per night, and I'll expand upon that in a second as well. And also to ensure their circadian rhythm is well regulated. Otherwise, their body has no idea when they're going to bed or when they're waking up. And that's why they feel perhaps a little bit groggy first thing upon waking as well. Okay, that's the first variable. The second variable is REM sleep. How many of you guys know what this means? Yeah, go for it. It's a very deep sleep that you really uh, recharge it. Uh, to an extent, what, what benefits do you get from REM sleep? Memory. Yeah, yeah, so it's rapid eye movement sleep and essentially it helps you recall information and also function well cognitively. Okay, now most clients I work with initially, they acquire only about 30 minutes per night when I first start working with them, particularly male clients. Female clients, not so much the case. Typically it's 60 to 90 minutes for female clients, but our objective is to get the clients two hours per night, as you can see being obtained here, okay? Deep sleep, how many of you guys know what deep sleep is responsible for? No one? Okay, deep sleep is responsible for physical repair and recovery. And of course, it's imperative for your quality of health, both short term and long term, okay? In terms of other variables we pay attention to specifically, one fundamental variable is awake time. As you can see, this individual is awake for only 29 minutes on that night specifically. Most male clients I work with, initially they're awake for up to 90 minutes to two hours per night without being aware of it. They could be tossing and turning, they may not be conscious of that, but their metrics are informing us very clearly that their awake time is elevated and therefore their sleep quality is diminished drastically. Okay, so of course you look to rectify that straight away. Another really important variable as well is heart rate and the variance of heart rate throughout the night. Okay, so as you can see here, this individual's heart rate decelerated as they're going to sleep and started to accelerate as they woke up. That informs us their circadian rhythm is very well aligned and hormonally their body knows what's going on. It knows when to secrete melatonin to actually induce sleep and also cortisol to ensure they wake up feeling alert and ready to function first thing upon waking. How many of you guys wake up and roll out of bed and you feel awful? You don't want to work, you don't want to get up, you don't want to do anything. How many of you guys can resonate with that? Only a few of you, really? Okay, I thought it'd be more. The reason for that is most, most likely because of course your sleep quality isn't particularly great, but fundamentally also your heart rate isn't elevating prior to waking. And that's why I feel so lethargic and slow first thing. Okay, so you want to rectify that 
by again ensuring your sleep start and end times are very, very consistent, and that's key, okay? In terms of other data we pay attention to as well, in terms of quality of health, we look at average resting heart rate. Our objective is to get the client to sub 50s, typically speaking, by improving their cardiovascular health as well. A lot of clients I work with, particularly individuals 50 plus, their heart resting heart rate is about 60, 70 BPM, perhaps even 80 as well. Not particularly great, and of course we look to resolve that pretty quickly. This individual is in a pretty good spot right now. We've introduced cardiovascular work for him over a period of about three months, so he's, he's getting much fitter, which is great. Other variables to pay attention to as well are readiness. Okay, so I typically don't focus too much on the actual cumulative scores of readiness and sleep, because again, it's just an algorithm putting it together. I pay much more attention to the individual metrics. Firstly, I'm looking at HRV. Do you guys know what HRV is? Anyone know what this is? Yeah, do you know what it actually infers or informs us of? Okay, informs us of recovery. So your response to uh, stress either psychological or physiological, okay? So if an individual I'm working with is very stressed out by business, their HRV will take a massive hit. That infers very much to their stress and overwhelm perhaps as well. Also, if an individual I'm working with is very active physically and they've trained too frequently, their HRV will also take a massive hit. And that's really important because it informs us of susceptibility to illness. It could be a cough or a cold or the common flu. Their likelihood increases pretty drastically when their HRV takes a hit, okay? Other variables we pay attention to as well is temperature deviation. So I had a really weird experience in which when COVID broke out, prior to COVID, everyone's metrics were going crazy. Their temperature was skyrocketing overnight and this must have been like February of 2020 before COVID became a really big thing. And I'd say roughly 75% of my clients had COVID at the same time and I saw that reflect in their data in terms of their temperature deviation. So it was quite a cool experience, but we can see if an individual is getting ill just based on their temperature deviation and therefore we can encourage them to kind of pull back and actually unwind a little bit more or prioritize recovering as well. Have you guys got any questions about aura metrics or does that make sense? Go for it, man. You said HRV takes a hit. Uh, what do you mean? Like getting, getting larger? Getting... No, no, it'll decrease. It'll decrease. So for example, uh, Ryan's average is about 80 MS. It would actually decrease by about, to about 40 for him if he was getting ill or he was overworked and overburdened. There's no optimal range, it depends on the individual. So for example, my average is about 130 MS, 140 MS. But again, I've had a background in sports. So I've been training since I was really young. As a byproduct of my HRV is typically elevated in comparison to most individuals. There's set points for certain people. But as an example, I personally don't consume caffeine. And as a byproduct of not consuming caffeine, my HRV elevated really quickly as well. Because again, I'm really hyper responsive to caffeine. It was actually placing a lot of stress on my body, even my sleep quality as well. So I moved it entirely. That's not to infer that all of you should remove caffeine. And I know a lot of you will be fairly dependent on caffeine. It's quite hard to remove yourself from. And you'll experience like a caffeine kind of flu as a byproduct of removing it entirely. But I would encourage you to think about it. I don't ensure that you feel much better on a day-to-day -day basis and much less fluctuant and, and varying in terms of how you feel physically and also perhaps energy-wise as well. Any of you guys got any other questions about Aura? Go for it. Yeah. Uh, how, like, how much importance do you put into that? Like, do you look at it at all? Because it requires you to either wear it not during the day or, or like, take your activities. Yeah, I personally ask my clients to actually wear the aura ring at all throughout the day, as you can see here. You can see the gap in data between about 8 a.m. to 12, 12 a.m. or 11.30. The reason being is because we can actually pay attention to that through things like an Apple Watch in terms of step count as well. We only really pay attention if the individual wants to improve their body composition. So if they're like morbidly obese or overweight, we really want to address that straight away. If the individual is already athletic and their body composition is okay, energy expenditure is a variable we monitor, but it's not really a priority as such. We more so prioritize their, their food intake in terms of caloric intake. Yeah? Any other questions about this data? Go for it. How long does it take to fix your sleep schedule to the point where your heart rate uh, speeds up? About two weeks. Okay. Yeah, it takes about two weeks for your circadian rhythm to adjust. So when you guys travel internationally, how many of you guys have difficulty realigning with your schedule when you come back home? A lot of you guys, different time zones, transitioning, etc. Yeah, it can take about two weeks for your circadian rhythm to readjust, which is quite difficult. So when that is the case, we actually introduce supplementation for the client as well. I'll run through, you through this as well. So the products in red are the products we encourage individuals to leverage when they are traveling internationally and going through different time zones. Glycine and GABA, when combined, deliver what I refer to as being a knockout blow for the individual. Okay, so it's not like melatonin, there's no detrimental impact, hormonally speaking at all, or kind of hangover experience. You won't experience that at all from glycine and GABA. It just ensures a parasympathetic nervous system is activated. You're nice and relaxed, and therefore your quality of sleep can improve pretty drastically. Okay? The products in green reincorporate. They are the lesser version, so to speak. So the products we incorporate with the client on a daily basis. So theanine, again, has a calming effect on the body. Most individuals report that they actually increase, their intensity of dreams increases pretty drastically, and that's because their REM sleep extends much more so than what they previously were experiencing. 
Um, magnesium l 3 again, activates the parasympathetic nervous system, so nice and relaxing for the body as well. And apigenin, I just personally prefer that over uh, chamomile tea. That's just a supplement form of chamomile. So if you guys want the supplement as opposed to the actual hot tea itself, use apigenin instead. Okay, does that make sense so far? Go for it, man. Okay. Um, is that normal? Is that just me being hypersensitive? Or it depends on the individual in terms of how much we'd recommend, but also we'd have to refer back to sleep metrics. So otherwise it'd be hypothetical just to analyze that. Okay. Yeah. So in terms of products we leverage, obviously I referenced all already. Yeah, so I would encourage all of you guys to purchase the product. By the way, I'm not affiliated to any of these companies. I've chosen not to be in order to have like a very honest opinion of them. Or is the best metric device on the market as opposed to Whoop? Whoop's incredibly inaccurate long term. I've actually worn both simultaneously for about two to three years. The variance in data from Whoop is pretty appalling in comparison. Whoop just looks way cooler. It's an active band. It's been marketed really well. There's loads of pro athletes that leverage it. Or is the much better quality product actually? Okay, so I would encourage you guys to leverage that. How many of you guys have actually leveraged a gut health testing kit before? One of you? Okay, two. Any reason why you guys haven't done this yet? Or is it something which it is not really aware of? Yeah, not really aware of? Okay, cool. So personally, we leverage a company called Viome and also another company called Omnos, which is based in the UK. I know the CEO pretty well. The company Omnos is actually much better than Viome, but costs a lot more. If you guys were to proceed with a gut health intelligence test, I would recommend Viome first, just to get a basic example of which food sources are positive or negative for you as an individual and cause inflammation in the gut or don't cause inflammation in the gut. Okay, I've shown you an example now as well. Let me pull it up for you guys. So it's one of my clients' data uh, uh, metric assessments back. I'll refer back to their testing kit. So this is what the actual profile will look like. So we can leverage supplementation to improve their quality of gut health as well, particularly prebiotics and probiotics, which you guys can see on the bottom right here. Having said that, if you guys are conscious of your fiber intake and you're also physically active, the use, utility of probiotics and prebiotics diminishes pretty quickly, but you can still incorporate them. There's no harm in doing so, okay? In terms of the actual information you derive from this testing kit, which is why I encourage you to leverage it, you have your food sources broken down into superfoods, enjoy, minimize, and avoid, as you guys can see on screen, okay? With the meal plans we put together for the client we're working with, we, of course, remove all food sources that come into the category of minimize and avoid entirely. The reason being why we do this is because the individual, if they were to consume these food sources, can, of course, have digestive health issues, upset stomachs, etc. And of course, also there's direct relationship between the gut and the brain in terms of cognitive function as well. So remove them entirely. That's not to say that Jack here can't actually consume any beef moving forward. We reintroduce it progressively once we start to address his quality of gut health and of course ensure his microbiome is healthy. Does that make sense to you guys? Yeah? How many of you guys would be interested in doing a testing kit like this now that you've seen this information? Okay, cool. Yeah, I would re recommend you all move forward with Viome. If you're in the US specifically, the results will come back very quickly. In Europe, it takes a little bit longer. It can be two to three weeks. If you're based in Europe, I'd actually recommend another company called Omnos. The testing kit is much more comprehensive. However, it's much more expensive. It's about double the cost. So it's about 500, 600 pounds to order. Okay, but in terms of the information you actually receive from this, it's much more valuable, much more detailed. And of course, you can also proceed with a consultation from the company or from someone like myself with regards to how to actually interpret this information. Does that make sense to you guys? Yeah, okay, cool. Uh, if I keep going down. So you have the microbiome test here. So that's 500. Is that for the US as well? Do they have that or not? Yeah, it ships to the US. It would take a little bit longer because their testing and lab sense is actually based in the UK. So you'd have to ship it back and then, yeah. By the way, on the odd occasion, please make sure you actually complete your biome test correctly. Otherwise, you'll get an email back saying your store samples leaked. And unfortunately, that means some poor postman's got shit on their hand, which is pretty gross. So please ensure you do it properly, okay? Otherwise, it's going to go horribly wrong very quickly. Okay, how many of you guys have done blood work before? A few of you guys? Okay, what's the reasoning for not doing blood work if you haven't done so already? Just not really been inclined to do so yet? Not really thought about the necessity of it? Okay, cool. Okay, cool. Where are you based? You're based in Dubai, right? Okay, cool. So if you're based in Dubai, how many of you guys are based in Dubai also? Oh yeah, two in total. Okay. So in terms of Dubai specifically, there's a company that I refer all my clients to. I'm actually partnered with this company. It's the only part the company that I refer to here that I am partnered with. It's called Bionic, and they actually proceed with blood testing work and personalized supplementation for the clients as well, which is great, and that's why we leverage it. Bionic specifically, if you're to proceed with them, they actually send a nurse to your property and complete your blood work in about five to 10 minutes. 
It gives you comprehensive analysis of 54 markers, which is great. And you can also actually assess your hormone profile as well, which is awesome, particularly for a male or female above the age of 30. It's really important to assess and of course address as well, yeah? So we personally leverage that for all the clients we work with. If you guys are interested in the actual PDF of the blood biomarkers we look for in terms of the blood work, I can send it to you guys after this as well. And I'll refer to it. Actually, I'll pull it up for you guys. You can take a photo of this as well. So this is the initial list of markers. If you want to take a photo of the first half, let me know and then I'll scroll down to the second half. Cool. And then the second half is here. And if you wanted a more comprehensive panel, we'd actually move forward with a hormone profile assessment as well. So certain clients I work with, we, we actually go for a profile of about 150 markers and we go through everyone step by step because there's a lot to address, okay? Typically, this isn't really a concerning variable for individuals unless they're under the age, over the age of 30. If they start to progress and go above the age of 30, it's more concerning and needs to be addressed more specifically. But also, we can of course derive uh, their, their quality of nutrition in terms of their fat consumption, et cetera, and how that's responding or causing either damage or positively in informing the body as well, based on this information, okay? In terms of supplementation, how many of you guys have prioritized supplementation yet? Have, have, a few of you guys. Okay, cool. Why have you others not done so yet? Any reason? Just a bit lazy with it, not really thought it was interesting. Yeah, okay. The reason why we actually move forward with Bionic is because the supplementation they provide is actually personalized based on the blood work, which is great. And therefore, in terms of the supplementation you're actually incorporating daily, it's specific to you. The amount of each ingredient incorporated is also very specific to you, and they can adjust it every three months. And therefore, the utility of it increases drastically. Whereas most individuals go to Amazon, Holland and Barrett and purchase 100 pounds worth of products, have no idea what they're doing or why they're taking them, and therefore the benefit is very minimal. How many of you guys can resonate with that? You've gone on a health kick, you bought supplements, you have no idea what you're doing. Yeah, a few of you guys? Okay, cool. Any questions about this so far? Or is that all pretty clear? Pretty clear about blood work? Go for it, man. I have questions, but it's more like the overall. Okay, cool. We'll dive into a few variables first and we'll come back to other questions. Okay. Yeah. Okay, with regards to training, I'll talk you through how I personally approach training for clients we work with and also for myself as well. And of course, you guys can perhaps take some value from this as well. So in terms of clients I work with, this is Vladislav here, he's based in Dubai. He's actually my age, so he's 25. His objective moving forward, of course, is to build his physique in terms of strength and of course, muscle tissue. And therefore you can see in terms of programming, we've got four workouts for him per week. So push session, pull session, lower body and full upper body. In terms of volume distribution, we're hitting between 10 to 15 working sets per muscle part per week. Does that make sense, you guys? Or is that a little bit over your heads? Make sense? Yeah, okay, cool. If he's recovering well, we'll increase his volume because of course his body's more adapted to the volume and stimulus. If not, we'll perhaps pull back his volume depending on his response as well, okay? In terms of improving his cardiovascular health, we have two sessions per week. One is aerobic and one is anaerobic. Do you guys know what the difference between the two is or is that something which you wanna dive into? Okay, cool. So aerobic is an easy session. We keep the individual's heart rate at approximately 150 BPM. So you guys should be able to talk throughout the session. It's not particularly taxing. It gets quite monotonous and it's quite boring at times, but it's really important to build your aerobic base, particularly from a recovery perspective as well. If you guys were to get into running or any form of cardiovascular training and you had to go balls to the wall every session, you'll get injured very quickly and you won't actually get very much faster at all. It's essentially a waste of time, okay, which is why most runners have no idea what they're doing. Yeah, but again, that applies to any form of cardiovascular work as well. In terms of the anaerobic component, you guys can see we have the tempo run up here on the Sunday as well. This is an interval session in which we get his heart rate up to 180 to 185 BPM. In terms of how we track this data, most clients we work with, we leverage a, an Apple Watch, like mine, this is an Ultra. You guys can get a more basic version as well that does the same thing, it looks a bit different. You can also use a heart rate monitor as well to get very accurate information from a company like Garmin, for example, and connect both by Bluetooth. But monitoring your heart rate when doing cardiovascular training is of absolute importance. Otherwise, it's not specific and you guys have no idea what you're doing in terms of cardiovascular work at all or how much you're exerting. Does that make sense? Go for it, man. When you run, what, what's your BPM? Uh, it depends. If it's aerobic session, it's about 150 BPM. Uh, and then you, you do other, like when you run, like train for a marathon? Yeah, yeah. So the majority of my sessions, so right now I'm training for a half marathon in May. I'm hitting my running workouts five times a week on top of my resistance training as well. My aerobic sessions comprise three sessions of the week, my anaerobic two sessions of the week. So my aerobic sessions, in terms of distance, it will escalate progressively as I get closer towards a half marathon. Then of course I'll drop off just to recover a little bit like a month or two prior. 
In this instance, my sessions right now vary between 10 kilometers to 15 kilometers, and I'm repeating that, so I'm clocking about 45 kilometers per week right now on my feet, which is quite a lot. Um, but in this instance, I'm keeping my heart rate at 150 BPM for the aerobic easy sessions. Again, that's quite boring, but in terms of pace, that's about five minutes 30 per kilometer in terms of how that translates. The anaerobic sessions are interval based like this. It doesn't have to be this exact workout. It could be different variations of this as well. It could be done on a treadmill, 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off, etc. My objective is very simply just to get my heart rate up to 180 BPM and then recover and then repeat. That's my speed work. Does that make sense? Any of you guys got any questions about this? Go for it. Yeah, that's fine, man. Yeah, any form of aerobic work is perfectly fine. And it depends, first and foremost, on your aerobic capacity initially. So for example, my resting heart rate throughout the night is about 32 BPM. So my cardiovascular health is really good and I've worked on that for years and years. If that weren't the case, doing like a normal activity like walking can elevate your heart rate quite drastically. So that'd be your first step. And then progressively look to incorporate more intense activity like running, perhaps sports, swimming, bike work, etc. Make sense? Go for it, man. When do I personally work out? No, I'm saying this is actually a problem that I faced. I was curious about your mindset. Like, I wasn't able to do training for like a month. Because basically, I train in the morning, and then I have the whole day with calls and training team members, and then I go to sleep at 9 p.m. So I couldn't, in theory, trade it, like, train in the middle of the day somewhere or at night. What's the preference for you? Is it consistent time, block it off, or kind of just like whenever? Yeah, personally for me, training is a priority, so it's consistent and is of course blocked off. So I train pretty much first thing upon waking for my cardiovascular work, and I hit my resistance session at 2 to 4 p.m. Typically, it varies between that time period depending on my responsibilities. I'd encourage all clients to do the same thing to ensure they actually hit their training sessions. Otherwise, how many of you guys can resonate with this? You want to train, but you get very busy and you don't train. I'm sure most of you guys in the room, right? But it's very easy to do. I, of course, block it off and therefore have no calls throughout that time period, and I encourage my clients to do the same. I appreciate that's difficult for some individuals, depending on how busy they are. I actually recently purchased this, uh, this kind of like home gym piece of equipment as well, which I'll show to you guys, which uh, negates any kind of excuse with regards to you can't train. I'll remove the man. Have you guys seen this piece of equipment called Vitruvian? No. It's a pretty cool thing. I wish they had it in lockdown. It would have been very, very cool. It's a platform uh, which goes up to 400 pounds worth of weight. So you can do all of your compound work, you can do your benching, your deadlift, your squatting, your accessory movements also, which is actually very, very cool. All in this piece of equipment. I purchased this at the back the start of last year. Me and Ed filmed a piece of content on it as well. It just fits in my office. If I'm really short on time, I do a workout on this. You can get a bench as well. You can get a lap pull down for this also. It's pretty handy. It's magnetic resistance, so it does feel quite a lot different to conventional lifting. And of course, I don't use it for very many sessions, be like two or three sessions in the week tops at max. I thought it was a gimmick. I thought all products like this were a gimmick, but it's actually very, very good. And it also tracks all of your training performance in an app as well. So in terms of monitoring your training progressions and your ability to overload, it does it on your behalf. So it's a really cool product and I would recommend it if you guys are of course short for time. It's fairly expensive, it's like 3.5 or four grand, but from, of course, I prioritize my training. So I think it's quite important that I incorporate this if I need to, if I'm short on time. Any of you guys got any questions on training? Go for it. Well, first and foremost, you need to monitor your weight fluctuations. The first thing upon waking every day, after you've been to the bathroom before consuming any food or water, to get an accurate reflection of your weigh-ins. If your weight's decreasing, you simply need to increase your caloric intake. Your caloric intake, how much food you consume. Very simple. If you're burning too many calories, you'll be losing weight. And if that's not what you want to achieve, you need to increase the amount of food you consume. In terms of how to approach that, there's a few ways that I would personally approach it. And I'll, I'll dive into this now on screen for you guys also. There's one of the clients I work with, he's 25, he's based in the UK, runs an agency right now in an education business also, it's called Jordan. As you guys can see on screen, can you guys see the numbers or is that a little bit too small? I can see it. See it more or less? Okay, he's consuming 2,500 calories per day. He's actually in a deficit, meaning he's losing about a pound to 1.5 pounds per week. That's his objective to improve his body composition, okay? You guys can see the macronutrient breakdowns here as well. So it's also really important. Some individuals in this space would refer to the fact that you must prioritize your diet based on just gut health assessments, et cetera. 
No, you need to factor in your macronutrient intake and your caloric intake as well to improve your body composition and actually know what's happening and how much you're feeding yourself, yeah? So in terms of protein intake, as you guys can see on screen, we're aiming for 200 grams per day. Carbohydrate intake, 207, and fats is a little bit higher than I personally like, but hits his personal preference, 97 grams per day. Personally, I'm more inclined to increase my carbohydrate intake as opposed to my fats, but again, I'm training two or three times per day. That would be why, okay? This is my personal preference. As you guys can see here, his first meal is consumed at 1 p.m. So he typically wakes up at 5 a.m., Jordan. He likes waking up very early. He's working throughout that time period, completing deep work in a totally fasted state. He personally doesn't consume any caffeine. Other clients of mine do, it's just their personal preference. And you can see his first meal comprises of just fats and proteins and fibrous greens. Okay, again, this is predicated on his gut health testing in terms of the food source that we incorporate and also based on his personal preference, yeah? So in terms of the breakdown of his first meal, it's 91 grams of protein, which sounds like a lot, I know. Five grams of carbohydrates, 85 grams worth of fat. So it's pretty high on that day specifically. And again, he actually wanted to increase that a little bit. So I, I kind of allowed him to do it. And his caloric intake is about 1,145 calories for that first meal, okay? His second meal is much more carbohydrate dense, as you guys can see. It's near 200 grams of carbohydrates in his second meal. Now, the reason why we time this specifically for him to be consumed at 6.30 p.m. is for sure it's consumed two and a half hours, three hours prior to his sleep start time. Okay, how many of you guys eat right before you go to bed? A few of you? Or maybe have done over this trip? Too close, okay, cool. As a byproduct of consuming food too close to bed, your heart rate accelerates, as does your core body temperature, and therefore your sleep quality is diminished pretty drastically as well. Yeah, so that's why we don't encourage it. And that's why, of course, for all clients, we actually time their meals for them and ensure they adhere to that as well. It's very important. If they don't, we can see it reported in their aura metrics because their heart rate's so high and then takes a massive dip. And that infers that their body temperature is also way too high for proper sleep quality as well. Yeah? So he's consuming 200 grams of carbohydrates. That also activates the parasympathetic nervous system and keeps him nice and relaxed prior to bed, which is actually really important as well. Yeah? How many of you guys consume carbohydrates and you want to kind of chill out, maybe have a nap, lie down? Many of you guys? How many of you thought that was because your blood glucose is spiking? Is that something which you believed? Yeah. A couple of times? Yeah, you get told that online, you consume carbohydrates, your blood glucose goes like this, etc. If you're metabolically healthy, and your body composition is okay, and you're not pre-diabetic, that will not be the case. Your blood glucose will not go like this and then crash. It won't happen. I do blood work with about 600 people at this stage. That's never ever been the case. We've used blood glucose monitors with the majority of clients as well. Carbohydrate consumption doesn't spike blood glucose that much, okay? It's, it's to an extent a myth that it's been massively kind of glamorized in a online content pertaining towards health and performance as of late, which just isn't the case, okay? Carbohydrate consumption activates the parasympathetic nervous system. That's why it keeps you relaxed and kind of drowsy after consumption, yeah? That's why we only incorporate it in the evening for the majority of clients we work with. Does that make sense? Yeah, there's a couple of exceptions. If they're training for a marathon, half marathon, et cetera, their carbohydrate intake will be quite a lot higher, 400 grams, perhaps even 500 grams. And therefore their meal frequency perhaps extends to three meals per day. The carbohydrate intake is in meal two, meal three. Yeah, go for it, man. I know you were talking about how like, it's important to eat at like, specific times consistently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's your thought on like, fasting? Because I usually do that like once a week or like go throughout the day and only eat one meal a day because it like, helps me with work. Mm -hmm. Um, is that something you encourage or is it something that you don't really recommend? When you say fasting, do you mean daily or do you mean just once per week you're doing like a 24 hour fast? I have my first meal like in the afternoon, mm -hmm. um, but then every week sometimes I do like a full day fast. Okay, man. Yeah, so me personally, I do a three day fast every month. How many of you guys have seen that being kind of glamorized by Gary Brecker recently? Like 10x health, have you guys seen that? The premise of a three day fast? No one? Okay, a couple of people head nods. So a three-day fast has been popularized recently by a guy in the space called Gary Brecker. He popularized it for, from my perspective, to an extent, the wrong reasons, really. He references the benefits of autophagy, which is basically the killing of bad cells in the body, and more so being utilized to kind of like a health insurance policy to mitigate illness long-term. Yes, there is some proof of that, but really the reason why we incorporate it is to reestablish a relationship with food for most clients we work with, and myself included as well. How many of you guys build a bad relationship with food by kind of snacking and you get in a rut, and then your relationship with food worsens quite quickly? How many of you guys resonate with that? Yeah, you can break that to an extent by incorporating a fast, right? How many of you guys have done like a long-term fast longer than 24 hours? Anyone? Yeah, how did you find it? Do you have a good time with it, difficult time with it? First two to three days were hard, but then after that, like your appetite just disappears. Yeah, it disappears pretty quickly. You can go on for quite a long time after that. Yeah. 
Some indi individuals report when they're doing a long-term fast, like a, a two or three day fast, they feel fairly dizzy and almost dehydrated. The reason being for that is they're not replenishing their electrolytes properly. So when you fast, you're not consuming any food, so no sodium or anything like this whatsoever. Okay, and therefore you're actually chronically dehydrating yourself. You consume loads of water because you're very bored, you haven't consumed any food, you go to the bathroom 20 times a day or something ridiculous, and you actually become chronically dehydrated. If you were to do a fast, I'd incorporate electrolytes, and I actually incorporate these for all clients we work with daily anyway. How many of you guys use electrolytes? A couple of people, okay, cool. And yeah, it's a game changer. Any reason why you guys don't incorporate electrolytes? Just not really aware of the utility? Is that why? I've heard also negative things about electrolytes. In what, in what respect? Uh, my host told me that the main thing that's important is the, is the salts. No, potassium magnesium is really important as well for hydration purposes. So the breakdown, for example, of a, a product... I, I, just, I just do salt, uh, like uh, salts. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, you can use Celtic salt as well. That's, it just tastes horrendous. So for a lot of clients... <laughs> Yeah, very similar. Yeah, there's no, no magnesium potassium in that though. So you can supplement that on top also. Yeah. With the clients we work with, they don't want to really incorporate Celtic sea salts because it tastes absolutely foul. It's just like a mouthful of salt essentially. And most people don't want to do that on a daily basis. So you incorporate a product like Element, for example, which me and Ed just had a sachet of before this talk as well. As you guys can see on screen, the breakdown is 1,000 milligrams of sodium, 200 milligrams of potassium, 60 milligrams of magnesium. All three ingredients are very important to hydration, not just sodium. Yeah, which is a common misconception. This breakdown in terms of the amount of each ingredient is great. There are other products which also have a very similar breakdown. You can get unflavored versions of these as well if you're aware of artificial flavorings and therefore don't want to actually consume them daily as well. This, the unflavored just doesn't taste particularly great. Yes, yeah, so if you guys are stepping into this and getting used to it, perhaps a, a raspberry salt will be a good way to go. Yeah, for me personally, again, I'm training two to three times per day right now, so fairly frequently, and I use a sauna daily. So I'm secreting a lot of sweat and therefore sodium. I personally consume three to four of these per day. So I'm consuming about three to four grams worth of sodium per day. Yeah. Now, previously when I used to train, when I really wanted to be, when I was an aspiring athlete, when I was 14, 16, I trained the similar kind of frequency and intensity and consumed very similar amounts of foods. And I was aware of these variables as being important, but I'd feel quite dizzy, really lethargic, be very dehydrated. I had no idea why, no idea what was going on. And actually, as soon as I introduced my, my electrolytes, I benefited tremendously very quickly. It felt much better, much more energized, Cognitively, I was sharp again, whereas previously I felt really lethargic and very, very slow. Just the byproduct of being unaware of the utility of sodium. Really, really important. How many of you guys got any questions on this? Go for it. Yeah, when would you take the electrolytes? It depends, man. I consume this first thing upon waking, because I train pretty much first thing upon waking as well, and I consume it throughout the day. My last consumption is typically about two hours prior to bed. The reason being for that is because I taper off my water prior to bed, so I don't need to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night. Yeah, because I don't want to wake up in the middle of the night, turn a light on, days into the bathroom and kind of, yeah, it's not great. Go for it. Is there a certain amount that you want to take? Like, is, if you like take too much, is it bad for you? Uh, it's not, yeah, not particularly great. It depends on the individual and it depends on their, and their energy expenditure. So if a client I'm working with, for example, trains once per day, perhaps uses a sauna daily, they'll take one to two sachets. Okay. It just depends on their, their level of hydration. If they inform me that they're peeing chronically and they feel really dehydrated, then perhaps we'll increase their sodium intake but it also depends on how much sodium they're actually acquiring from food sources as well. So if they're seasoning their food or consuming food which is very high in sodium, which could be junk food, for example, then of course we're conscious of their sodium intake from supplementation. Make sense? Go for it. Um, let's say you're doing you know, 72 hours fast. Yeah. Um, how many of your sachets do you have? I personally consume three to four every day. Yeah, yeah, because otherwise, again, you're just consuming huge amounts of water. It could be three or three and a half liters, which a lot of people do when they're fasting because they're very bored and want to drink something instead. And you chronically need to go to the bathroom and therefore you're just dehydrating yourself all the time. Yeah. Any of you guys got any questions on this? Any questions about fasting, anything at all like that? Okay, cool. Go for it, man. Yeah, a handful. Yeah. Uh, yeah, typically, but of course we want to address the, the foundational pillars as such with regards to their nutrition and other variables which could cause inflammation firstly, and then we'll look into approaches like that. Yeah, it depends on the client also, and it depends on their, their background or history in terms of their adherence to a nutritional diet which is conducive towards what they want to achieve or, or not. It depends. Have you found that certain types of diets that are better for uh, Removal of carbohydrates initially can be very positive, and then perhaps reintroduction. Yeah, it depends, again, their adherence also. 
there'll be a handful of people that we want to remove carbohydrates from entirely, and progressively they just start to consume loads of carbohydrates without telling me. And then long term, of course, the, the benefit is dissipates pretty quickly. Yeah, does that make sense? Any of you guys got any questions on that? Go for it. Just regarding water intake. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I drink filtered water personally. If you guys were to look for a product for this as well, you could actually purchase it from a company called Aquatrue. Again, I'm not affiliated with any of these companies, it's just the products I use personally and for my clients also. It's a great filter and it's on top of the counter as opposed to it being a, a filter which you actually put into the actual sink if you're renting a property as well. It's gonna cost you about 250 to 300 pounds. A lot of the clients I work with leverage these products also. So yeah, I'd recommend it. Obviously glass water is great. Uh, glass bottle water is also good as well. But yeah, you can just purchase this product just for ease of use. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Of course. Yeah, I just consume olive oil. Is that for myself? But if if I'm out eating in public, I'm not too concerned. Uh, I know loads of individuals have become very anal with small details like that. Yeah. For me, it negates quality of life pretty quickly. Yeah. So if I'm out eating with my girlfriend, for example, I'm not going to pay a huge amount of attention to that. I'll be conscious of my food choice and I'll consume steak primarily. But I, I won't ask them if they're cooking in olive oil or anything like this. Okay. It's once a week. Yeah. It's fine. I'm consuming steak. It's not the end of the world. Yeah. Any of you guys got any other questions on this? Okay, cool. I'll run through a few of the other products we leverage. So obviously I referenced Aura Viome. Um, in terms of actually tracking your heart rate and your energy expenditure, I would recommend an Apple Watch as well. Just turn off the notifications. Otherwise, it's really jarring, particularly if you're working. Your wrist is buzzing all the time. It becomes very irritating. Um, the utility of the products, the Series 9 does exactly the same thing as this product here, which is the Ultra Watch. It's just way more expensive uh, because it won't break. That's the only thing. So it's actually used for diving, swimming. That's why. So I just didn't want to get one with shattered, essentially. Um, blue light blocking glasses is something which became very popular a couple of years ago. My glasses personally are lenses, but they have blue light blocking filters in them. So they're prescription and have filters in them as well. You guys could, of course, also leverage this product, particularly if you're conscious of your seat quality and want to improve that variable. However, most individuals shoot themselves in the foot. They buy blue light blocking glasses and then sit in a room like this until midnight. Really bright light, they're exposed to it continuously and you have light receptors or receptors in your skin which are responsive to light and therefore the benefit is negated pretty quickly, yeah? So if you do want to be conscious of improving your sleep quality and of course you've established a set time which you are going to bed, ensure you are winding down in some capacity prior to bed. You are dimming the lights, you're using red lights if possible from a company like Philip Hue, for example and you're really trying to relax prior to bed. For me personally, I use the sauna pr approximately two hours prior to bed. And the reason is very simple. It elevates my heart rate and my core body temperature. And therefore I'm expelling heat for the next two hours or so, which means my core body temperature decreases and my sleep quality improves pretty drastically. The sauna. Yeah, so personally for me, I sit in there for about 20, 25 minutes in one go. It takes a while to build up to that because it can be quite painful and <laughs> suffering to be fair. Um, but it's about 90 degrees Celsius, the sauna that I personally use. So it's, I kind of like the suffering component of that as well. I, I enjoy it. For me personally, I like sitting in there, just kind of processing the day and reviewing what I need to be doing next. So I sit in there in silence. Other people use AirPods. I'm just not a massive fan of that. I'd much rather kind of use it as a time to reflect personally. Go for it. Is there a, a sauna that you found that worked in an indoor setting? What do you mean? Like, can you buy a sauna that you can put into a park? Uh, I haven't looked into it much. The one at the gym. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. And in the previous building that I lived in, there was a sauna downstairs by the pool. So I just went down there every evening as well. Oh. But yeah, of course there will be. I, I personally advocate for a dry sauna though. You can use red light or infrared saunas also. The temperature won't get to the same level. It'll be about 15 degrees cooler Celsius than the dry sauna. 15. 15. So it gets about 75 degrees Celsius. Um, I'm not... I understand the benefits from like a, a in infrared perspective for sure, but I much rather the kind of experience of sweating getting very, very hot in terms of benefit, it facilitates my sleep quality. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, go for it. So you don't have a sauna. Yeah. Is it also beneficial to take like, like a warm shower? Yeah, it absolutely. It won't have the same carryover in terms of benefits and extremity of the benefit, but yeah, the same principle applies for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't personally tested them, so I wouldn't really feel confident on speaking on it. But in principle, yeah, it makes sense. I actually recently got sent this product as well by a company that they wanted me to shoot an ad creative for. Let's see if I can find it. It's a, an at-home sauna. So it's like a portable sauna thing. 
is actually pretty cool to be fair. It gets to 75 degrees Celsius, so it does get pretty hot and it feels quite a lot hotter in there. So if I don't have time to go to the gym in the evening specifically, then I will use this. I think it was, it's not particularly expensive either. Let me just see how much it costs. Oh yeah, 350. So it's pretty good, but it depends on how much space you have and the convenience element of that as well. Yeah, but I would recommend a product like that. It's pretty good to be fair. Yeah, yeah. So you go to the gym two hours before you sleep. Yeah, for me personally, yeah. Is that to work out or just to sit in the sauna? No, just to sit in the sauna. Yeah, yeah. In terms of sleep supplementation, you guys might want to take a photo of this. It's a company which we leverage for the sleep supplements we incorporate. So glycine, GABA, magnesium, L3, and L-theanine, apigenin. Um, it's great if you live in the US. If not and you're in Europe, you may want to look for different options, but these products in principle remain the same in terms of benefit and utility. How many of you guys live in Europe and experience seasonal affective disorder? Where it's dark in, in the mornings, dark when you go to bed, it's quite depressing, you feel, have difficulty feeling alert. Yeah, okay, cool. For, to mitigate that, I personally incorporate a light alarm clock as well, which progressively gets brighter for a period of 15 to 30 minutes to wake me up more gently and ensure my heart rate also elevates, as opposed to waking up abruptly, which feels pretty horrible, to be frank. And I'm sure you guys have the alarm on your iPhone, and when you wake up, you're like, oh, you shudder, it feels horrible, right? That's mitigated by a product like this. I also incorporate this product here which is a seasonal affective disorder light. So it's an SAD light. Essentially, the objective here is very simple. It's to replicate somewhat of the benefit you can experience from exposing yourself to sunlight first thing upon waking. Yeah, so if I'm sitting down and working for the first hour on the day, for example, if I'm taking a rest day for myself, I'll use this for the first half an hour to an hour whilst, whilst working as well to expose myself to some bright light and ensure my circadian rhythm is, is aligned as best as possible throughout the winter months. Does it make sense? Yeah, okay, cool. Pretty cheap product. Utility is pretty good, so I, I recommend it, of course. Uh, obviously, Aquature I already referenced. Um, in terms of scale, we personally leverage a company called With Things. The reason being is because they have an API integration, which is actually being integrated to our software, which we're launching soon. So that's why we leverage it for all clients, so everything can sync into one platform. But any scale does the job perfectly fine. Obviously, I referenced Bionic in terms of supplementation. This is the cost breakdown of this. So three months of personalized supplementation will cost you $750. But again, every variable is personalized, which is great. Um, and therefore, of course, you're informed of and ensure that, that everything you are consuming is positive and conducive to your quality of health, as opposed to being a waste of money and time. And finally, I came across this product last week, which I thought was pretty cool for those of you to get distracted very quickly. This product is called The Brick. Um, it's a product which you scan with your iPhone, and it actually ensures you can't use any of the apps on your phone which you've selected, which I thought was a pretty cool thing, as opposed to the blocking feature on your iPhone, which you can easily bypass. This doesn't allow you to do it whatsoever and is only $50. So I thought it was a really cool product, which people can make the most of. I'll personally be purchasing a couple for myself and of course my girlfriend also to ensure she's more productive. But go for it. How do you say it works? It doesn't like, you said you scan it? Yeah, you scan it. I think, I think it's through Bluetooth, something like this. I haven't really looked into it too much yet, but I definitely will be purchasing one for myself. But um, it prevents any apps you're using from being bypassed or you want to use from being bypassed from the lock. Unlike the features on the iPhone, which you can bypass really easily. Yeah, so if you're completing deep work when you're, first, when you're waking for the first few hours of the day, this could be a good product to leverage as well. Okay, cool. Have any of you guys got any questions so far? Was that all pretty clear? Go for it. Uh, red light therapy? Yes. So yeah, every day. Yeah, yeah, my red light panel. Yeah, I personally have Juve, but I got sent it. So I'm biased because it was like a six grand panel I got sent. But yeah, any of the products do very similar benefits. Yeah, go for it, man. Yeah, uh, so you mentioned the Apple Watch. Hmm? Uh, No, the accuracy of data is not great. So again, a similar way that Whoop, for example, is positioned on your wrist, the accuracy of data from that point is pretty crap in comparison. In terms of heart rate, I also don't trust this for heart rate monitoring either, really. That's why I use a Garmin heart rate monitor, because it connects through Bluetooth. But just to have a, like, a equivalent of an iPhone on your wrist to track that data and see it in real, real time is why I use it, personally. OK, go for it, man. So um, in, in terms of order of importance, hmm? Yeah, that's a great question. Awesome. Awesome question. So yeah, so I personally approach it as, as follows. So let me go back up. So again, we prioritize these six variables for the very simple reason that most individuals can't actually describe to me what they believe to be uh, health quality or how they would achieve that. So we try and make it as fundamentally simple for the, the customer as possible. First and foremost, it would be sleep quality. That's why this is placed in order of importance from my perspective. It would very much be sleep quality first. 
I personally think it's that that's the foundation, particularly from a cognitive perspective, from a recovery perspective also. And again, in terms of susceptibility to illness or disease long term, there's so much data supporting the importance of sleep. Right? I saw that firsthand with someone like my dad, for example, who was chronically sleep deprived throughout my entire life. Right? Nutrition, with regards to doing gut health testing first, and then of course being aware of your caloric intake and macronutrient intake and your meal frequency, very important also, and cannot be undermined. Right? Also, the, the quality of food you are consuming, of course, is something which you must be prioritizing and ensuring that the food source you are consuming are very, very good as well. Yeah, particularly when you have the capital to do so, like you guys do in this room. For a lot of the clients we work with, we either introduce a chef or someone who can pair meals for them and actually send them to the customer on a weekly basis. They drop them off two or three times per week. That's a great way to go. Meal prep companies are pretty appalling in terms of quality of food and also the ability to customize it is pretty appallingly bad. So I wouldn't recommend that. Yeah, chef or someone that can pair meals for you and drop them off once or twice per week is definitely the way to go. Go for it. Uh, I, for, for myself personally, I communicate with the chef for the customer and my team does that. So we don't have actual SOPs for it. We manage it ourselves. But it fundamentally be pretty simple. Uh, there's not apps, there's agencies. There's, there's agencies that do it. Otherwise, you're going to have quite a hard time finding someone that's good and reputable. Yeah. Although, if you have like a family friend who's a great chef or great cook, then you could support them financially as well and ask them to do it. Uh, more or less, 1 to 1.5. Yeah, yeah. So it's not too bad. It's pretty good. Well, in terms of how much they prepare for you. No, typically they charge per hour. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so they charge like, over like a two or three hour block every day, essentially, is what, what. That makes sense? Yeah. Okay, cool. In terms of behavioral change, that simply refers to the adherence to a process which you know is conducive to quality of health or not. And obviously, we, we will undermine ourselves from time to time and do bad things in terms of adherence to bad habits. But. Ultimately, that's something which we keep our clients accountable to, and that's why I speak to them one-to-one -one still. In terms of training, medical testing would definitely precede this in terms of order of importance. Medical testing is fundamental to your quality of health and determining if you're susceptible to illness long-term or your likelihood increases. Obviously, training would then apply, and of course, supplementation is kind of the, the icing on the cake, so to speak, really. Yeah, particularly for every variable dialed in. Go for it, man. How much hour, uh, hour do you sleep? Sorry, say again? Uh, nine in bed. I spend nine hours in bed. Yeah. And the reason why is because I, that depends. If I can, if my wake time exceeds half an hour, then my sleep duration is about eight hours per night, but nine hours spent in bed. Does that make sense? So it's more so like an insurance policy for my sleep. Yeah. Whereas most individuals spend eight hours in bed and they're asleep for only six and a half. Does that make sense? Yeah. Personally, nine to nine thirty and wake up at six. But I've also got a new puppy, so yeah, it's like having a baby. <laughs> Go for it. No, because I'm I've consistent with those variables and have those variables dialed in. My wake time is about 30 minutes per night. But for an individual that's not so dialed in with that and is starting, their wake time will be anywhere from an hour to 90 minutes. Okay, but like the actual time that it shows Yeah. In terms of like sleep time, is it like eight and a half? Yeah, eight and a half. Eight. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. More or less than most nights. Go for it. Yeah, personally, I've been in a relationship for four years. So we don't really go out that often. We go for dinners and stuff, but kind of like a normal time. Um, if you were to go out and you're younger than me, you're still going out frequently or dating or whatever. If you were to go to bed late, I'd encourage you to wake up still at the normal time you would do so. Otherwise, disruption to your circadian rhythm is way more drastic. So if you were to go to bed at one, as opposed to your normal bedtime at 9 p.m., for example, and you had to wake up at like midday on that day, you're going to feel terrible for the next seven to 14 days. So I would encourage you to wake up at the same time. You will be sleep deprived for that day, but it ensures that that night you go to bed at your normal time again. Whereas if you wake up later, your ability to go to bed at the same time again that day, pretty much non-existent. Yeah. Any other questions? Go for it. Yeah, regarding uh, diet like um, carnivore or keto, <laughs> yeah. Yes. But what if you were lifting maybe for 40 minutes, maybe three, four times a week? Would you, would you okay, so what would be your reasoning for wanting to adhere to keto or carnival? Just like simplicity, it's nice, you eat the steak and you forget about it. Simplicity makes perfect sense, totally agree with that, understand that for sure. In terms of your fiber intake, that could be a variable which you need to monitor very carefully. There's also no need to reduce carbohydrates entirely at all for most individuals, and therefore there's no reason why you should adhere to keto or carnival. 
Unless, again, for simplicity purposes, yes, I understand. However, of course, glycogen is also very important for cognitive function as well. The one thing I would make you aware of is if you were to adhere to keto, if you were to go out and you were to slip out of keto, getting back in can be quite a painful experience. And therefore, that's why I'm not a massive advocate for it. Because most individuals don't have the discipline to adhere to keto for months and months on end. Unlike one of our friends, Yorn, this guy that I work with, he's spectacular adhering to the premise. But most individuals aren't. And therefore, they slip in and out and it's, it goes pretty terribly wrong for them.